tragedy has exposed. Yes, this is clearly a major UK national and international police effort to work out how and who put those 39 people into that trailer overnight from Zeebrugge to here in the Essex Docklands, where they were found behind that police cordon at about 1.40 this morning, each and every one of them dead. Also tonight, Brexit is paused as European Union countries debate how long an extension to offer. So, if not a Halloween Brexit, will it be an election for Christmas? Explosive testimony in the impeachment inquiry into Donald Trump as leaked evidence suggests US military aid to Ukraine was dependent on them investigating the president's rival. And in a change of subject, President Trump lifts sanctions on Turkey and defends his decision to pull US troops out of Syria. We're done, he says. Now Turkey, Syria and others in the region must work to ensure that ISIS does not regain any territory. It's their neighborhood. They have to maintain it. They have to take care of it. It was the early hours of this morning when the emergency services received the call, but it was too late. They arrived to find 39 bodies in the back of a lorry. We know no details yet about who these people were or where they were from just that they likely died an unimaginably, unimaginably awful death. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, is on the industrial estate in Greys in Essex, where the lorry was found. Alex. Yes, well, the police are saying they have a 25-year-old man from Northern Ireland who's being held in custody on suspicion of murder. Given these numbers, we're talking, uh, I'm afraid, mass murder. Now, we can't remind ourselves enough that man is, of course, completely innocent unless a jury decides subsequently uh, that he's not. That said, this is an enterprise, the scale, the scale of which is clearly going to involve more than one suspect. You're talking about international organised crime here. So it's very clear, therefore, why the police are saying, obviously, this is a very early stage of their investigation, both on two fronts. One, preserving the dignity, which the police have done commendably today, of those poor 30s, 39 individuals in that vehicle, uh, and also uh, taking a full time to announce formally when all the postmortems have been completed who those people are and their connections to the family. That is a difficult uh, exercise, to put it mildly. So too, of course, a long, deep and detailed international criminal investigation. In the shadow of the Thames crossing, passingly familiar to millions, an area of trade, of transit, now the international focus of a mass murder investigation Forensic teams examined the articulated lorry. Ambulance crews called here at 1.40 this morning, soon discovering they had 39 bodies in the trailer, not 39 casualties. Everyone found inside this trailer was dead. Early indications suggest that one of these people was a teenager, the rest are believed to be adults. A murder investigation was launched and the lorry driver, a 25-year-old man from Northern Ireland, was arrested on suspicion of murder and remains in police custody. The Northern Irish driver has been named locally as Mo Robinson. This is a unit pictured on his Facebook page. This, a strikingly similar truck, was filmed today inside the police cordon. The trailer is marked GTR 128D and GTR Trailer Rental Solutions, a company based near the port of Dublin. The Bulgarian government says the Scania truck is registered to the city of Varna by a company owned by an Irish woman. So as the world's media obviously gathers at the cordon here, the police are saying this is, of course, very early stages of what they are treating as a case of mass murder. They say the process of identifying just who the people were in that truck would take several days. 39 people, and we believe one of them just a teenager, found dead in appalling circumstances in the utter normality of an industrial estate in South Essex. Well, I say really, it's just uh, you do get the lorries parked up. Obviously, they have to stop every now and then, obviously because of long distance travelling, but you do always see lorries parked up down on the side of the road all the time. Police now believe the trailer travelled from Zeebrugge aboard the Melusine, this Belgian 24,000-ton roll-on, roll-off ferry. She docked here at Purfleet at 24 minutes past midnight this morning and sailed this afternoon. 
They believe the driver drove a cab from Hollyhead to collect the trailer from here at about 1.05 a.m. It's about a 15-minute drive to where the bodies were discovered. Prime Minister said those responsible must be hunted down. His Home Secretary talking of close cooperation with Europol. There is a degree of organised criminality here, and whether it's in Europe or whether it's outside of Europe, we will always stand firm against this and make sure that we collaborate with all our partners. About a year ago, officials in Belgium asked their British counterparts for greater cooperation over the problem of people smuggling. They also demonstrated they were keen to show their latest technology to counter the people smuggling problem. Did they not use it? Did it not work? At around five this afternoon in Essex, the police moved the vehicle with all the bodies still inside the trailer to a post-mortem location at nearby Tilbury Docks. Well, we're joined now by Matthew Carter from the Red Cross. Um, Matthew, thanks for being with us. Goodness me, the Red Cross, a name synonymous with international disasters with war zones. Here we are tonight talking about an incident in the Essex Docklands. It says something about the scale. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, uh, if you look around the world today, there are an awful lot of people forced to leave their homes because of conflict, because of, uh, of poverty. And, um, you know, it's hard to overstate the, the desperation that people must feel to, to put themselves in the danger of getting back in a lorry, uh, back in the back of a lorry like this. And, uh, you know, our hearts go out to the families of the 39 people that have lost their lives. That is the point, that your work globally, Red Cross, connects absolutely to the despair uh, that we've seen fatally here. Yes, absolutely. I mean, over the last few years, we've seen the migration getting harder and harder to, to achieve and the legal routes for migrants to come to places like the UK and claim their legal right to asylum shrinking. Um, we've been calling on the UK government to open up some safe and legal routes for, for migrants to come here, to not rely on um, smuggling, which can end in tragedy. Right, now tell us about the work you're doing here. Some of us are obviously familiar with seeing human bodies uh, dead, but the emergency services on scene here, perhaps not so. What have you been doing for them? Yeah, so we've been here since about noon today. We've got uh, three vehicles and, and five uh, volunteers down here providing what we call practical and emotional support to the emergency services. So we've set up some, some vans to, for them to come and uh, have a cup of tea and a, a safe place uh, to kind of reflect on what's been a, a really harrowing day for the emergency services. We had one uh, chap from the uh, forensics team say it's the hardest day he's had in 30 year career. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a really tragic day for everyone involved. I mean, everybody's been commendable in their efforts to obviously preserve the dignity of those poor individuals. Are you able to shed any any light on what kind of scene befell those who came upon it just behind that cordon? I mean, I don't really want to go into, into specifics, but I mean, it doesn't take much to, to fathom the, the uncomfortable journey for someone to be in the back of a lorry for any length of time. Uh, 39 people in the back of a lorry. And Un uncomfortable is perhaps something of an understatement. <laughs> absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I come back to the point that you, how desperate have you got to be to make, to, to think that's your best option to get into the back of a lorry? Um, you know, people might well be coming, travelling to the UK because they have family members or, or some, see some uh, benefit of travelling to the UK, but they need to be able to do so legally. They need to be able to claim their, uh, claim asylum here legally. Great, thank you very much. Matthew Carter there from the Red Cross, and indeed, how desperate do you have to be to get in the back of a lorry when that's your best chance, you think, of getting safely into the UK? Back to you. Alex Thompson, and police have set up a line for anyone uh, appealing, uh, seeking information uh, to come forward to help them with their investigation. The numbers to call are on the screen right now. Well, as you heard there, the driver arrested is believed to be from County Armagh in Northern Ireland. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Andy Davis, is there for us tonight. Uh, what can you tell us about the man arrested, Andy? Well, if it turns out to be the man many have named in reports, and I stress this has yet to be confirmed by the police, then he is believed to be a 25-year-old called Mo Robinson. On his Facebook page, he lists Laurel Vale as his hometown, and that's where we are tonight, about five miles south of Portadown. On his Facebook page, he describes himself as a lorry driver, and there is a photograph of a lorry cab 
which bears a striking resemblance to the one found in Essex today. We've been trying to get a clearer picture of what might have happened to him over the last 48 hours. We went to a family address here, but there was no-one there, and uh, neighbours declined to comment. And what about the lorry container itself? Well, that lorry container had a sign on it which showed that it had been rented out to a company called GTR Trailer Rental Solutions. Now, that appears to be an Irish company. We uh, contacted a number on their website, but uh, it went straight through to a voicemail. One of their company addresses is linked to a farm about 20 miles south of here in County Monaghan. And we drove there this afternoon. And when we got there, there were a number of uh, similar lorry containers parked up there. Uh, no one could put us in touch with any of the owners of the company. But uh, some of these containers had very similar GTR markings to the one pictured at the scene in Essex. We were told that... They were there for repair, sort of a depot, basically, where some were being cleaned, that they were regularly hired out to, to people and uh, sometimes would contain uh, pharmaceutical items. But, as I said, we weren't able to contact this company for a response, and I should stress that we're not aware of any evidence that Mr Robinson or this GTR company had any idea of what actually transpired to have been inside that lorry container. Andy Davis. Well, joining me now in the studio is Sabir Singh, Chief Executive of the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, and Richard Burnett, Chief Executive of the Road Haulage Association. Um, Mr Burnett, give us a sense of the checks that lorries will go through and that drivers will go through, and, and will drivers always know what is in the trailer? So, so if you go through uh, Calais or you go through uh, Coquelles into the UK... Uh, the checks are, are pretty robust. There are, there are CO2 uh, checks, there's CO2 monitors, there's heartbeat monitors, there's sniffer dogs, the, the, there are scanners that scan the vehicles as they go through. It's, it's a pretty robust process. And every vehicle is checked? Absolutely, yeah. So, 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 so that, that happens there. That's not to say that other ports up the coast in Europe have the same robust principles of checking. And, and, and Zeebrugge has a scanner, but I would suggest that, that it's not robust in, you know, in a similar kind of way. I mean, is it assumed within your industry that there are people who are collaborating with people smuggling? I think in our industry, I think, I th I think there is an assumption that that, that that does happen on a very small scale. But I think, I think there's a broader piece here which is suggesting that traffickers are using whatever means they possibly can to actually get migrants into vehicles. And we're seeing a change in, in, in their modus operandi. You know, they're, 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 they're taking the, the uh, hinges off the tops of trailers, pulling the doors back, getting migrants into the back of, back of the trailer and then doing those hinges back up again. So it looks like those... But you know, that's the... not credible with 39, is it? I mean, we've all seen at ports, you know, people running in between lorries, but this number of people must be organised. Well, I, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is, this is potentially organised crime where the traffickers are actually taking those, those steps to make it look as though the vehicle... You know, is still sealed. So when the driver does the daily walk around check, that it looks like everything's intact. Something is saying a lot of people will just assume that this is inevitable. This is what happens when you have borders. Is that correct? Yes. In some ways, this is inevitable, but it's also totally avoidable. Thirty-nine people, all of whom at some point, somewhere, were loved by someone, are dead and the complete absence of safe and legal routes for them to make those journeys makes you think, what on earth makes us think that this is not going to happen? If we close off all the legal routes for people to move across borders and the totality of human history tells us that people are going to move, we've always moved, if we close those off, all that is going to happen is we empower the smugglers. But how, how is this avoidable? Because there are always going to be people who are not eligible to come here. You know, in any immigration system, you can't have a system in which everybody can come, so you're going to have some rules and some people aren't going to qualify. Well, just looking at the reality of who's moving and why they're moving, we've closed off, you know, any route for people fleeing conflict to be reunited with their families. We've closed off routes to claim asylum until you enter the UK. So people who want to claim asylum here, perhaps because they've got family here rather than in some other part of Europe, have to get here first to do that. 
rather than being processed through some ideal type European corporation. So you have to make it here illegally, it's the old problem. So you have to make it here illegally. And so you're faced with this awful situation where the choice is, do I stay here wherever I am, potentially face misery, hardship and death, or do I get into the back of somebody's truck and also face potentially misery, hardship and death? It's a horrible, horrible choice for people to have to make. Let me just bring into this conversation from Pearlie, Tony Smith, who is the former Director General of the UK Border Force. Tony Smith, how shocked are you that this has happened again? I am shocked because, firstly, container uh, traffic doesn't tend to hold illegal migrants. We did have a container three, three years ago. There was a fatality there, sadly. But this is a very unusual route for uh, irregular migrants, in my experience. It was traditionally uh, in the backs of vehicles through Calais um, that people were getting on board, largely within the port area. Uh, there's been a lot of investment in the port of Calais by ourselves and the French to secure that port, so it's very hard now to penetrate through there. We've seen the small vessels and sadly some drownings uh, over this year uh, on small vessels trying to get into the Kent coast, but this is uh, a, a dreadful uh, episode and just demonstrates to me how desperate the smugglers are, are, are becoming in and, and having simply no, no regard for human life. This is all about money. It's all about profits. It's international organised crime. And, uh, you know, let's hope that the National Crime Agency and our colleagues in Europe can uh, get after the gangs that are behind it. But could it also be precisely because so much attention has gone into Calais, that Calais has become harder, and so people smuggling gangs will now exploit other ports? Well, I wouldn't say it's precisely because of that, but it's clearly a displacement effect. I mean, we've had a couple of reports from the independent chief inspector in the last couple of years about how the border force is performing, both in Calais and also on our south and east coast ports, and we're doing quite well, uh, actually, in, in, in preventing this sort of thing. But, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of freight comes through these ports, and there's a very, very, fortunately, very, very rare incident that this sort of things happens. But yes, you're right, there has to be a displacement effect. They're not going to give up. There clearly is a market for people to pay lots of money to go through these sorts of uh, things on the back of a promise that somebody's going to lock you in the back of a container and let you out again at some point. And people are prepared to not only put their lives in other people's hands, but a significant amount of money. And we need to get the message out there that please don't do that. Please do not trust people promising you passage and putting you in a vehicle. You may die. And I'm afraid that's a, a, that's a stark reality of, of border security these days. We're also in the middle of a process, obviously, in which we are talking precisely about new checks on borders, new checks on borders in the Irish Sea uh, and, those, and those ports there uh, and, and possibly new border force, you know, uh, operations all around the British coastline. Is that going to make it harder for this kind of thing to happen or perhaps more desperate and more likely that you see these kinds of deaths? What we need in the border force is data, and not just the border force, but HMRC uh, and across our government. We've got a very good targeting centre in this country. We need data. Obviously, ad additional data will come in uh, from intra-EU traffic that wasn't there before, which will be helpful to us, although it's going to be quite hard for people to provide that to us. What I'm more concerned about is that we do continue to collaborate at an international level uh, with our partners in Europe. That's with Europol, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the Belgian Customs, the French path. There is, a, I know, good collaboration that goes on now, good intelligence, data sharing platforms. There are sections, I know, in the political direct declaration which enable that to continue. And I, I sincerely hope it does, because that is my biggest fear, that if we're not able to share intelligence and information with our partners, uh, this is international organised crime and it demands an international response. Sabir Singh, I mean, we've sort of mentioned this already, but people are dying in the Mediterranean all the time. I mean, is, is it just that it's so far away that we're not really thinking about that? But it's all part of the same problem. Yes, I mean, our geographical position means we're not a transit point. We're, you know, at the very western edge of Europe and we're not even on the mainland. So we don't see that challenge in the same way. But it is all part of the same problem. People are on the move. Are, and are, again now with, with more fighting in Syria? With, with much more fighting in Syria and places in North Africa, you've got the climate crisis pushing people out of areas where, you know, the soil is drying up. And right now our response to this is build our walls ever higher and they shall not come. But they will. And if we don't provide those routes, if you make illegal that which is inevitable, all that will happen is illegality sets in. You have organised crime and smuggling. Just last word, um, Richard Burnett. I mean, the police are obviously appealing for information. Do you think people in your industry know more about this than 
I think it's, it's normal hard. to let. I think it's very hard to say at this point in time as to whether or not this is organised crime, whether the driver is actually involved in it, or whether or not it's it's been opportunistic in Europe in terms of how those migrants have got on board. I think we need more information, more clarity from that investigation to to understand exactly what's happened. Richard Burnett, Sabir Singh, and Tony Smith. Thank you all very much. Jackie. Well, today's events bear many of the hallmarks of a similar tragedy at Dover 19 years ago. Then only two of 60 Chinese men and women survived. They were collected from a warehouse in Rotterdam, packed into a refrigerated trailer behind cartons of tomatoes, and then transported on board a ferry from Zeebrugge. Our senior home affairs correspondent, Simon Israel, spent many months covering that story. He reports now. Today's tragedy brings back memories from 19 years ago. 58 Chinese men and women died in the back of a refrigerated trailer on board a ferry to Dover from the same port as today's victims, Zeebrugge. They were hidden behind boxes of tomatoes. The air vents had been closed for the journey to silence any sound. The driver got 300 pounds ahead, 18,000 pounds total, and ended up with a 14-year jail sentence for manslaughter. His human cargo had boarded the truck at a warehouse in Rotterdam, having been transported halfway across the world. Almost 20 years on, and what they term the irregular migrant passages across Europe have barely changed. They run from countries like Iraq and Iran, through Turkey, into Eastern Europe, via countries like Bulgaria and Albania, and all the way through to the Channel ports. Over two decades, millions have been smuggled or trafficked along these routes. There are no safe options available for so many of these people. Oftentimes they are left abandoned for months and sometimes years on end in very dangerous and often exploited circumstances themselves. And many countries keep turning their backs on them. So of course, they will strive to cross a border in the desperate hope sometimes of being reunited with family, sometimes just in the desperate hope that the next place they might get to might prove to provide the security they absolutely need. You need help? More recently, there's been a focus on human smugglers using dinghies to bring migrants across the channel. Britain and France intensified efforts to crack down two months ago. But according to the National Crime Agency's threat assessment, that represents only a small proportion of attempts to get into the UK. Most, it says, use containers and refrigerated HGVs. Back in 2001, Kent Police used Gurkhas to help reconstruct what it must have been like in the back of that container. They were chosen because they were of similar size to those smuggled migrants who never made it. Then, it took police many months to identify them because they had no papers, just a mobile number written into their clothing. The task facing Essex police today may be just as difficult. Simon Israel reporting there. Well, in Andy Davis's live report a few minutes ago, he said that the trailer in Essex had been rented to the company GTR, but he should have said the trailer was rented from that company. Well, the issue of migration and, in particular, the dangers people face has become a huge issue across the world in the last decade. We've become depressingly familiar with stories about people being found in trucks or bodies washing up on European beaches. Well, I'm joined now by Ahmad al-Rashid, who made his own perilous journey from Syria to the UK, and Mohamed Yahya from the United Nations Development Programme, who's been researching why may migrants make journeys they know put their lives at risk. Thanks very much, both of you, for joining us. Ahmad al-Rashid, I must ask you first, you made your own horrifying journey from the Middle East to the UK. I wonder what you felt when you heard the news today. The first thing that came to mind when I heard, you know, when I read the headline, was to think about their families, their loved ones. Um, it's, it's a tragic tragic, you know, um, um, incident. Um, and this is the first thing that came to mind, because I know they have loved ones and families behind. And you know from personal experience what that horrific journey, which ended today in tragedy, is like. You spent some of your journey in the back of a refrigerated lorry. In fact, I was in the back of a couple of these, you know, refrigerator 
um, Lori is back in 2015, and in one of, in one of the incidents, I was kept there for two hours, and we started, you know, to to losing. We couldn't breathe anymore. It was freezing cold, so we started to knock and knock and knock. Then the the smuggler came and he let us out. So um, I can relate to this horrendous experience because most of the time, you know, um, you would almost uh, you would see death in, with 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 your own eyes. And you live virtually, I'm imagining, the whole journey with that threat of death hanging over you. The big question, of course, is why, then, do you make those journeys? Why do people make these journeys when they know it could cost them their lives? Now, for me personally, I'm speaking, or, you know, for myself, I'm not speaking for the many others who's, who made their journey because each one will have their own reasons. But for me, when I left Syria at that time, it was... You know, I crossed from Syria to Turkey, um, uh, and it was, you know, a, a dreadful situation in Syria, and it is still now a very dreadful situation in Syria. Um, the bombing and the shelling, and at that times you had the, the radicals, you had the, the, the knives of ISIS, and then you cross the borders, you know, um, you're still in the survival mode. But then you start thinking about, all right, as a father, you know, um, with two children who I cannot get them out of that, what should I do? Where is the, the place of safety where my children will grow up in a safe place, but also there will be a future for them. Mohammed Yaya, I would just want to ask you, first of all, for your thoughts on the scale of this tragedy today. Yeah, it's very, it's very tragic. Uh, um, unfortunately, it, it seems to be happening quite frequently uh, in the Mediterranean and in the Sahara. Um, those who are crossing from Sub-Saharan Africa to uh, have to overcome those barriers to be able to... Uh, come to Europe to, uh, to seek opportunities that they may not find in their own home countries. Um, it's very tragic, uh, but it, unfortunately, if the status quo remains, it's something that we will see more happening in the future. So what is the answer? As we've heard, many of these migrants, many refugees, they know that this is a perilous journey, but they still continue to make it. What is the answer? Well, there are two types of, of, of migrants who, who come. There are those who are, uh, are refugees or seeking asylum, who under international law are entitled to asylum. And there are those who are coming uh, uh, for economic reasons. And the, the groups who are coming for economic reasons is what we researched. And for them, for them the reason that they make the journey is uh, uh, mainly because they feel that their dreams cannot be met in their own home countries. And um, what we say uh, in, in the report we uh, published two days ago is how can African governments uh, ensure that they become more competitive in ensuring that their own young people find opportunities in their own countries. And also then uh, advise um, uh, uh, European policymakers by giving them the right evidence to, for them to understand who is exactly coming. Uh, so the, the, the report uh, essentially gives voices and... and, 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 and uh, showcases the type of migrant that who's coming uh, in, in relation to the education they have, the family sizes, the reason they, 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 come, uh, they want to come to Europe and uh, their, their attitudes to return or if, whether if, they want if to as stay your in research, Europe And this is the story we if tell. Your, if, as your research suggests, people are not deterred by the threat of death, you know, what do you tell those European governments? What do you tell them about what they can do? Yeah, the, the report is called Scaling Fences, uh, precisely that these young people uh, face economic, social and political uh, 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 fences in their own home country. And when they, when they try to, when they start their uh, long journey migrating to Europe, they also have to overcome uh, other forms of fences, which, inclu which includes crossing uh, the sea and, and, and then and trying to, uh, to go to the destination countries they, they, um. they want, they want to... Uh, Ahmed uh, Al Rashid, sorry to cut the... across you there, Mr. Yaya. We have to. We have very little time. Yeah. Just to return to you, finally, Ahmed Al Rashid. I mean, you say these people today will be remembered by loved ones, but you worry that many others will read the headline and forget about it after a while. Why do you think that? What, why do you think the world, in your view, doesn't care enough? I think there are lots of people who do care. Um, you know, um, I've been in this country almost over four years, and many, many people did care. But I think there, you know, I think um, because of the um, of the complexity of migration, and unfortunately, migration today is being used as something, you know, very negative. While the reality, it's not. It should be something that everyone should celebrate and advocate for. 
if it's done, you know, legally um, and, and, and peaceful. And I think there are two, two things to add here. You know, I think finding legal pathways for people to make these um, journeys legally and safely is very important, but also addressing the main causes of why these people are fleeing yeah. their homes at the first place is very important. Ahmed Al-Rashid, Mohamed Yaya, thank you both for joining us. Thank you so much.